Lady C, you know that I got so into your book, I read it in one sitting because it was so compelling. Of course, this is an updated edition of a book that you wrote pre-Megxit. So much has happened. And of course, a lot of the information that you were revealing has not been picked up yet by the mainstream media. Really? Why do you think that? Yes, in fact, I've been getting very interesting questions from members of the public, such as, can this jam thing be a diversion to keep people away from my book? And can X and Y, and then can can the, oh, there's something else that people have brought to my attention, which I can't think of at the moment, because who knows, you know? But I think, I, I know from when I wrote my first Diana book, that the palace were studious to avoid, uh, you know, they actually tried to bury the book by sending in Richard Aylard to tell lies to Eve Pollard about the book and about me. But I don't think that's happening this time. I think it's I think it's uh, not the palace per se, although I don't think the palace wants certain things uh, sh having a light shone upon. So I think uh, there's that going on. And I think you have Meghan and Harry's supporters quite desperate to avoid awkward questions being answered, which have been raised in the book. So, you know, and it, you could almost entitle it silence, silence, silence. And if we ignore it long enough, maybe it will go away, but it's not going away. There are... There, there's too much going on for it to go away. The thing I don't understand, Lady C, is why does the palace not learn their lesson with you? Because, of course, you wrote the ultimate Diana book in the early 90s. This is before Andrew Morton, before lots of the revelations about Diana were accepted. They tried to shut you down then. Of course, the revelations were proven to be correct. So there's a real track record of you writing the truth before the newspapers, before the mainstream media pick up on it. Well, I don't think, Dan, in fairness to the seniors at the palace that they're trying to shut me down, I think you know that an awful lot of the staff at the palace are completely incompetent. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> you know, and their default position is, well, if we don't do anything, maybe maybe uh, we won't be blamed for anything going wrong. Uh, so their default position is inactivity, which is quite different from don't explain and don't complain. And there is, and you will know, because we've spoken about this privately, that the, the level of incompetence is beyond belief. And uh, as I've told you before, I've had to tick off various senior members of staff <laughs> for their totally inadequate way of dealing with things. In fact, I told one of them, as I think I told you, that if he had been employed at Castle Goring, I'd have pitched him out on his air. <laughs> And this was the person who was responsible for all of the communications for the Queen or the late Queen and the royal family. So certainly there are lots of communication issues. But look, let me ask the question that everyone wants to know. Mm -hmm. Does Buckingham Palace have questions to answer regarding the births of Archie and Lilibet, the children of Harry and Meghan, and potentially whether they should not be in the line of succession, which let's be honest, this is a difficult question, but it's a question that has constitutional implications and is surely in the public interest. Well, it certainly does have constitutional implications and it is in the national interest. Uh, I think the matter should be cleared up one way or the other. Of course, you can't blame the palace for the mess because they didn't create it. Uh, and, you know, they have found themselves caught up in what they regard as a no-win situation. 
And on the face of it, it is a no-win situation for them because Meghan and I suspect to an extent Harry have mm. also played things so cannily that the palace are, if you they they think if they do, they die. If they don't, they still die. But I don't think that's actually true. I think they should they should beat Harry and Meghan at their game. And the matter should be cleared up. You know, the citizens of this country have an absolute right to know that anybody in the line of succession has a valid place there. And there should be no doubt whatsoever. And if the participants have created a doubt, which Meghan and Harry have certainly created, uh, whether you could say that the doubt is a valid one or not is another matter altogether. And I need to say that for legal reasons, as you will know only too well. But, you know, they, it's their conduct, hers especially, but he has been collusive in all of this. And yes, I think that this, and this is something that's not going away. And, you know, I've spoken to people about this uh, at a very senior level, and it's not going to go away. And they can play ostrich till they're blue in the face. It's uh, ultimately, they are either going, to, well, I suppose if William accedes to the throne without a problem, and he doesn't travel with his children, there will be no foreseeable problem. But if they continue traveling, on block, there is a valid ongoing concern as to the fact that you can have Harry and Meghan on the throne, which I think would be the end of the, the monarchy, but then you would also have Archie and Lilibet in the immediate line of succession, way in front of everybody else who was born without any queries and Meghan's conduct and Harry's conduct are the things that have created these questions. And I think it is in the interest of the British crown and the British people that this be addressed very straightforwardly. Provide the proof to the world that those children were, well, let me rephrase that. I want to be careful how I put this. Provide the proof to the world that those children were born in such a way that no questions can be asked, which means they have to provide absolute proof that Meghan bore those children and was delivered of those children herself. Failing which, this is not going away, and it's thanks to Meghan's conduct and the way she has conducted herself, that these questions have arisen in the first place. And it is insupportable that in a democratic society where this is a constitutional monarchy, and let us remember, this is a constitutional monarchy that is actually not the true line, because the true King of England is the Duke in Bavaria. Mm. So this is a constitutional parachuted monarchy. It was parachuted in, in 1689. And they have, there are many people who actually in the line of succession have a far greater right to, to the present king than he does. And all of this needs to be cleared up because if it's a constitutional monarchy that was effectively imposed upon the nation by parliament, there are rules and regulations that exist. And until 1936, you had always the Home Secretary witnessing the birth, and nobody would ever have conceived that any member of the royal family would ever marry so inappropriately that the conduct of a spouse of a member of the royal family, a, a woman, would actually cause these questions to validly arise. I think the whole thing stinks to high heaven. And I, I, for one, am sick and tired of being hounded by people about this. And I'm sure if I'm sick of it, 
there are others who are even far more sick of it, but it's not going away. And they can completely put their heads in the sand and think it's going to go away. It's not going away. It's never going to go away until they provide, the palace provides proof who the doctors were, all signed off, everything signed off. And if they can't do that, because we have a right to know that who is closely in line of succession is entitled to it. And if they can't do that, I'm afraid those children should be removed from the line of succession forthwith. It's a of simple course, segment. Historically, there's a reason why the Home Secretary used to witness royal births. Having read your book, Cover to Cover, my impression is that you have personal doubts, having done your investigation, about whether at least one of the children was born naturally. Well, Meghan's conduct throughout has, and, you know, the, the way she has performed during her magnancies uh, has certainly caused Tremendous doubt for many people. I've had doctors, nurses, endless women who have given birth in touch with me. You know, they get in touch with me. I don't get in touch with them. Uh, I have friends who have given birth repeatedly. And Megan's performance has been so unique. Now, I'm not saying that she didn't give birth to those children. I'm saying that her conduct has created the doubt that she did give birth to them. And we, as, this, as citizens of this country, have an absolute right to know that our future king and queen are entitled to sit on the throne. It's as simple as that. And this is not a family matter. This is a constitutional matter. And, you know, I have nothing against those children being Lord and Lady, uh, whatever wins. Uh, they're, they're entitled to have the full function of adoptive or surrogate children with all the honours that go along with that. My two children are adopted. I have nothing against children being uh, entering a family via adoption or surrogacy or anything else. But I certainly do have something against us, the British people, having two, pe two, two figures in the line of succession whose mother's conduct has led to the doubt that they actually are entitled to being in the line of succession. It couldn't be simpler. They need to have, we, we should, the purpose of the Home Secretary was that there would be no warming pan incident ever again and no sleight of hand that no bastard which is the legal term uh, that no bastard would be able to be acceding to the throne unjustly and why should eugenie beatrice peter phillips sorry phillips all of them be knocked out of the line of succession for two children whose arrival has been cloaked in cloak and dagger secrecy and whose and, and, and whose legal mother has behaved in such a way that valid valid doubts as to their their means of arrival have been raised it's as simple as that it couldn't be simpler now, I've received so many questions on this, Lady C, from outspoken members, so I want to put a couple of them to you. Jan Kitchen asks, if the general public knew of the rumours, why did it suddenly go quiet and not gain traction? Was this another Biden laptop-style cover-up by the MSM? Did Sussex squad members take some action? Did Harry and Meghan issue some sort of gagging orders, or was it all three? I am not aware of any gagging order. If there were a gagging order... I'm I not aware either. Think, no, so I don't think there was a gagging order. Oh, I think the mainstream media are terrified 
the because Harry is, and Meghan have been suing them left, right, and center, and until all those cases are resolve, resolved, they wouldn't want to address this because of the financial implications. Uh, also, many of them are cowardly, to be dead blunt about it, and they don't want to embarrass themselves or their employers. And, you know, some of their employers will want to be able to go to lunch at Buckingham Palace once every 25 years. Uh, well, you know what that game is like. And so there's all of that going on. But I think a lot of it is fair and cowardice. And also, you I agree. It's, un it's unprovable, you know, because it's the whole thing is covered in opacity, but it's mm. also covered in contradiction and it's also covered in inconsistency. Well, of course, of course, because Lady C, you'll remember the birth of Archie. I was the journalist raising the alarm about all of the lies that were told at the time by Team Harry and Meghan. There was a cover-up going on. Why would you cover up a royal birth? Why would you not be honest with the media? Why did they lie to other members of the royal family? Why did they lie to other courtiers? The whole thing stinks. It's weird. Um, look, uh, Sam asks... On her YouTube channel, Lady C has mentioned several times that this spring there will be a revelation coming out about Harry and Meghan and that they will get some sort of comeuppance. Can you ask her if this is still on track to be revealed in the next few months? Well, I think people ought to consider what I actually said. I said that matters would develop in such a way that Harry and Meghan would get their comeuppance basically because various questions would be asked and various truths would surface. So if people expect, people people need to keep their air uh, close to the ground and see that what's going on now could well be the beginning of, of the clearing up of all sorts of mysteries. I mean, Harry and Meghan have played a very destructive game where the not only the British people are concerned, but our state, our constitutional structure. Because Meghan, by, they, one of the things they did was they amended Archie's birth certificate. And then she announced that she had done it at the instruction of the palace. And the palace said, no, she had done it at her own behest. Now, for legal reasons, there are certain things I cannot say at this time in on this forum. But, you know, Megan, if those children were not born by surrogacy, she has created the situation and caused people to believe that they could have been born by surrogacy. So this would be mischief making of the highest order and extremely damaging to the royal family. So they, she has created what is effectively, they think and everybody thinks is a lose-lose situation. I don't think it's a lose-lose situation. I'm used to dealing with the Megans of this world. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you something, it's dead easy to snatch victory out of what they think is the jaws of your defeat. And the royal family can do it really simply. They can think all they need to do is come clean because they have come clean with every other birth. Every other royal birth has been signed off by reputable doctors. These two births have not been signed off by anybody. If those children, we need the proof that those children popped out from Megan and that they are of her eggs. Because exactly. British, and British it's very law, Sorry, British law requires not only that they come out of her body, but that they be of her body. So if they're implants from someone else, forget it, they're illegitimate. And in terms of, of our 
in terms of succession to the throne. So, and as I say, I have nothing against adopted children or surrogate children. It's fine. I mean, I think however children come, they should be loved and cherished. But also, how unfair is it to those children that you have all of this speculation from before they were born, and this will follow them for the rest of their lives? The whole thing is the height of irresponsibility. And I'd like to see somebody at Buckingham Palace man up and woman up and and just do what should be done. Clear yeah, yeah. up once and for all. The, yeah, doctors, yeah. the doctors and things. And remember, Meghan and Harry actually on their Netflix show actually showed a scan of Archie, if I remember correctly, except anybody who knows anything about prenatal scans will know that there are identifying features on that scan, all of which were removed. Why were they removed if that is a true scan of Archie? You see, these are the questions that need to be cleared up. This is the sort... There, there should be there should be no room for mystery as to who is legitimately in the line of succession. And if there is a mystery, they should be removed from the line of succession. It's as simple as that. And the palace can do it very simply. And if they can't do it, then those children need to be removed. And the palace needs to come clean and say, Sorry, we had nothing to do with this. This is a but you see, that's the situation Megan has has maneuvered them into, where effectively, if those children were born of a surrogate, she has maneuvered them into a no-win situation. Mm. And which because I know as a fact that there is no way that they would have gone along with any of that. And, no. and you and I both know enough behind the scenes to know that whatever happened, the palace found out about it after it had happened. Oh, yeah. They had and no idea. They had no idea, and they had no idea even when Archie was born and Harry and Meghan were members of the royal family. They had no idea why they were lying about the time of birth, why they lied about which hospital he was born in. They were pulling their hair out. They didn't understand it. It, it was really odd. Uh, look, Lady C, I want to cross now to our first outspoken member in Australia. It is four in the morning, believe it or not. And this is Dave Murphy. And Dave was desperate to speak to you, Lady C, because he's actually due to be at your Peterborough live show but he's had a few medical issues but instead he can join you uh from across the world and dave i know you want to ask something of lady c hi dan hello, hi lady dave. c hello dave how are you lovely to put a face to your name <laughs> you too i'm so sorry i miss peterborough but i'm so glad to speak to you now and thank you dan for this opportunity oh it's amazing I'm to have you dave and thank you for getting up so early. What what do you want to ask Lady C? Lady C, I'd just like to know, I love the book and I love how you've treated the reader with intelligence, even, even um, where you've, you allow the reader to come to their own conclusion, even where you put about Dora, a Doria Ragland and a prison document, um, not saying it's the, you allow the reader to come to the conclusion. But do you think there's any super injunctions out there against Harry and Meghan, which has prevented any of the mainstream media from reporting the truth about Meghan's malignancy? And if if it was a surrogate or if the palace found out there was a surrogate, there's a super injunction? Because in Australia, uh, the media aren't even allowed to report if there is a super injunction. But given you're not a journalist, if there was a super injunction, would that forbid you from saying so as well? Well, there is no super injunction. So there is no super injunction that I'm aware Correct. of. No, there's not. There's not. So, the media are terrified, Dave. That's right. They're cowards. Mm. They're not only terrified, <laughs> they're cowards. You can be terrified and brave and do what you're supposed to do. They're simply cowards. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them are craven opportunists who are rarely interested in feathering their own nests. 
and keeping their show on the road. Is that not a fair assessment of most of them? Not all of them, but most. Oh, absolutely. But all I would say is that given the financial situations lots of media organisations find themselves in, very often they are prepared to neglect the truth in order to save money. And the problem is, you know, Lady C, Harry has become the most legally trigger happy man in the world. He wastes money. He wastes time. And lots of newspapers just think, oh, we can't be bothered with that. I agree. It's weak. It's not something I would ever do. Uh, but that's that's why I think sometimes they're making these decisions. I agree with you, but you see, I think that's tactically unsound. Mm. I mean, if they had studied history and if they had studied wars, they would know that that is really tactically unsound. But let's not go there. <laughs> no, indeed. Dave, thank you so much. Thank you for yeah. being with us. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And love um, to talk to you thank you so much. And if anyone, would like to ask Lady C a question, of course, uh, on video, then just put your hand up uh, right now. But loads of questions are coming in, Lady C. Uh, let's, this is this is a bit of a curveball one, but it's uh, interesting. The Empress asks, what does Lady C know about Charles Spencer's relationship with his children from his first marriage? And why didn't he show up to Lady Kitty and Lady Amelia's wedding? I think in, it would be injudicious to say anything except that they are all estranged. Uh, when children don't invite a parent to a wedding, it's usually for a good reason. And let's leave it at that. Uh, Catherine Bai asks, in your opinion, how did being raised by only a father affect Megan? At what point did she actually reconnect with her mother? Was it when she decided she needed to play the race card? Uh, well, her father was her primary caregiver for most of her later childhood for about 10 years. And she saw very little of her mother. Her mother only ever went to her school once, which was for the graduation, Immaculate Heart. Uh, she was, her father was, he worked long hours, but he always found time to, to take care of her and to give her treats, etc. And he was on a very good salary. He was on over $200,000. Uh, 25 years, 30 years ago, 30 years ago. So, I mean, that's pretty good money even now. And then it was maybe 10 times what it is. So he spoiled her rotten. He, like most single parents, he compensated. He tried to be both father and mother. My understanding is that Megan used to go and see her mother and come back dripping poison. Her mother was always pumping poison into her system and that Megan would come back with an attitude then she'd settle down after a few days and this was when Doria was around uh, and she'd go and see her mother then come back her mother also according to the family uh, was heavily into the druggy scene so her mother was hardly uh, a positive influence, let me put it. And is that, that marijuana? Is that the view? Well, I gather it was not only marijuana, but other things as well. Crack, I think, mm. or whatever. Whatever you smoke, I'm not really into drugs. Mm. No, and of course, we should, we should point out that some of those drugs in California are legal. Uh, no. 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 They weren't, no. They weren't legal. 20 and 30 years. Ago. No, good point. Um, Lady C, we've got another outspoken member on the line. Becca, Becca, where in the world are you? I'm in Gatwick. Oh, lovely, lovely. Cool. Calling Hi, Lady. Hi, Hi, uh, great to have you here, Becca. What's your question for Lady C? Uh, well, Lady C, I've been watching, uh, sorry, reading your book, and in the book, um, the 
the people at the palace and the the media at large was at the beginning thinking that us who had the uh, questions about the pregnancies and everything that we were crazy conspiracy theories uh, do <laughs> they still think this sorry repeat the last bit becca sorry do they still uh, think it yeah if uh, if the people at the palace and uh, and the journalists and the main, mainstream media they were thinking that we were all crazy conspiracy theorists and not for believing that there was on, something on towards with the the pregnancy do they still believe this or have they started to see where we're coming from well i don't want to speak for anyone by the way becca good to see you i don't want to, to see you again i don't want to speak for anyone uh but you would have to be brain dead and no powers of reasoning and and blind and dumb to think that there aren't valid questions that have been raised and we're not dealing with fools but we're simply dealing with people who who don't it's this has never arisen before this situation has never arisen and if it is if it is not handled if, and they have tried to handle it in as responsible a way as possible and also remember the the institution of the monarchy is a lawful institution governed by law and custom and protocol and they cannot go against the law and they can't break the law if they suspect that something is amiss they can't break the law to prove that it is amiss even if they are furnished proof that it is amiss unless that proof comes to them in a good clean legal way they can't act upon it so to a large extent the monarchy is has its hands tied because those two children were put in the line of succession because the palace was tendered valid birth certificates stating that Harry was the father and Meghan was the mother. That is the basis upon which those children were put in the line of succession. Now, if the palace, this, if the palace thought that that was not, uh, that there was some doubt, how are they going to be able to prove it, except through a law, through lawful means? And if and there is no way of proving it through lawful means, because in this country you can't just pluck out somebody's hair and run a DNA sample. And you you know there there are all sorts of safeguards for the protection of each citizen. And Harry and Meghan are both well. Harry is a citizen, and Meghan is entitled to the rights of any other person in this country she has human rights as well so it's it's not as simple and straightforward as the public would think it is do you not agree there no i completely agree i completely agree uh cat harvey has asked a question lady c and she wants to ask if you have had trouble yourself from the sussex squad and if there is any legal protection from this kind of online activity it's bad she says this is cat harvey that people can be paid to act maliciously and for all concerned to remain anonymous well uh I'm a great believer in freedom of speech. Uh, I certainly think that we have sufficient laws in place if people are abusing other people. You know, there are malicious communications acts, uh, there's defamation, etc. So, uh, and of course, cowards will. But as far as I personally am concerned, and the Sussex squad to answer the question, I don't look at all of that rubbish. I never go on any of those things. I couldn't care less what they say about me. They can say anything they want about me. I couldn't care less. As far as I'm concerned, you know, they are like a bowel mo movement. You flush it. You don't let <laughs> it hang around and savor the stink. So no, I, 
I couldn't care less what they say about me. Uh, and I think people should take that view as well. And also, we need to be very careful about shutting down people whose message we don't like, because other people don't like our message. And just as how we are entitled to open up our mouths and speak, they should be entitled as well. And if they're breaking the law, that's another matter. But if they're not breaking the law, let them say whatever they want. They can say anything about me that is within the law. I, First of all, I never know what they've said. And secondly, even if I did, I would sort of think, get rid of the stench, you know? <laughs> I mean, honestly, <laughs> they're not Treat worth them with the contempt they deserve, exactly. No, exactly. Uh, Mary Gildeen uh, asks a question, Lady C. She says, as an American woman, I am embarrassed by Meghan Markle's behaviour. I am relatively young to have lost all my siblings, and I can say that William is going to need his brother at some point. Any chance of that happening? Any chance of a reconciliation, maybe even after King Charles's death? That's the question from Mary Golding. I would be very surprised. What I have been told, and I believe it, and also I I know of similar situations where one sibling has betrayed another sibling and uh, attacked that which it should not have attacked. And they're never forgiven. Even, uh, and even if you end up you know, you might skin your teeth across a room at, at a large event, uh, and you, you might even extend an invitation to them for a large wedding. But no, uh, my understanding is that the relationship is over ad infinitum, that William and Catherine will never forgive not only what Harry did, but what Meghan did. And in particular, the, the reports about from Givenchy about the bridal fitting and the way Charlotte was distressed. Let's let's put it like that. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, this is a really interesting question from Kim Silvio, who asks, Lady C, it's reported that Kensington Palace have changed the way they interact with the media. Kensington Palace, of course, being responsible for William and Catherine. And Kim asks, do you know whether this is correct? And if it is, what do you think about the changes? And I would just add, Lady C, I think they need to make serious changes because they made life difficult for Catherine over the past few months. Now, of course, lots of the mainstream media have acted appallingly. Lots of people on social media acted appallingly, but I don't feel like Kensington Palace particularly did a good job for Catherine. Am I being unfair? Well, Dan, as you know, I'm not a journalist, so I, and such interaction as I have with any press office is li very limited. And usually when I ring them up because of something that I have to ring them up about, and if I don't like what I hear, I give them a piece of my mind. <laughs> and if I do like what <laughs> and I And are very scared of that moment. <laughs> if I do like what I hear, I'm very nice to them. And the girls who answer the phones are usually very nice. Uh, but insofar as... So I'm, I'm not really the right person to speak about about the Kensington Palace, the way they manage publicity. But I would have said, I've been around now for 74 years. I can't um, believe it. I refuse to believe it. Well, 47, 47. <laughs> more like it, that's more like it. <laughs> but, but I have been interacting with royals for most of my life and sometimes with their staff. And I mean, some of the staff is very dedicated, but you know, I think I have grave reservations about the way the, the Kensington Palace and Buckingham Palace are run at in, in interacting with the public. I 
I'm not sure that they haven't made a huge mistake in, in thinking that they should employ people who may not necessarily be their strongest supporters. You know, I mean, it's, you know, you, it's, there's, and some of the advice they're giving, I think, is pretty injurious when it's not unhelpful. And so, but I can't really answer the question mm. in terms of the competency of Kensington Palace Press. I mean, what I will say is that there was certainly a feeling that they didn't deal with the Catherine situation particularly well. And what I am told happened is that William and Catherine brought in some trusted experts from their past who they felt could manage the situation better. In saying that, though, I would say the media acted appallingly. Uh, Lady C, can I just ask, how do you think Catherine is doing at the moment? I've heard she's doing pretty well. And, you know, I mean, chemotherapy is not a picnic for anybody because no matter who you are, it knocks you for a six. Uh, but I gather she's doing pretty well. And... You know, and what are... about Charles? What about the king? Well, he's certainly plunging back in with great force, but <laughs> uh, you know, let's move on. <laughs> okay, well, great. We've got we've got Cat Ellen on the line. Cat, where, where are you? Where are you calling in from? Dan, do you not recognise me? We met at London Zoo. I was the pregnant lady oh. in the wheelchair. <laughs> Out of the wheelchair, you look so much more glamorous. Well, I'm eight <laughs> months now, so I'm surprised. <laughs> oh, cat, amazing. Great I'm, to see. I'm, I'm, I had I'm, I had a love, just so everyone knows, I had a lovely meeting with Cat at London Zoo. And uh, she was heavily pregnant, so her lovely man was pushing her around in a wheelchair. And she posted a very, very nice tweet about me, and I was very grateful for it. So it is great to see you. Um, and Kat, what's your, you're in the UK, obviously. What's your question for Lady C? Yeah, I'm from the Isle of Man. I'm on the Isle of Man at the moment. Um, my question is, do you think the royal family have any intention whatsoever in stripping them two grifters of their titles because <laughs> everything they do, literally everything they do is on the back of them every appearing appearance they make they pocket that money and it's all because of who they are and their titles i was just want to know whether the lovely lady c has any knowledge to why they haven't done already or whether they have any intentions to or is would there be some kind of a protocol for that Mm, good well, question. Well, yeah, it's it's complicated. But before I answer it, Kat, can I ask you a question? Sure. How many months pregnant were you when you were in the wheelchair? Oh, um, oh must have been seven. Yeah, it must have been about six or seven months. Yeah, so, it wasn't <laughs> so, so I'm curious to know. I'm curious to know. Yeah. Um, why were you not at eight months able to get down on your haunches in high heels with your, was... with your legs tightly sh shut and your knees glued together? And oh, I see what you're you doing there. Go down on your Maybe. knees and bounce up with no your chance. Your <laughs> no you... chance. There's absolutely no chance. Not in a million years. It's absolutely. Well, Possible. Me and my mother were talking about it the other day, and there's there's just no way. <laughs> it's impossible. Well, so, unless of course you're Megan, in which case it's not only possible. It's uh, it, she does it. She's she's so wonderful at it that she doesn't even need her husband who's standing right there to help her up. She just bounces <laughs> back up. <laughs> now, the arm, and the leg. bump just I'm... seems to disappear. Anyway, yes. Sorry. Back to the question. Back sorry. to the question. <laughs> no, no, Dan, the, jump, the, the bump decided it was going to explore the base of her spine. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so to answer the question. Yeah. Could they be stripped of their titles, Lady C? I, it is, 
they Harry is a born prince. He can only be stripped of his title by, well, he can be stripped of his princely rank by the king, mm -hmm. or by, by the monarch, I should say, because George V stripped Prince Alistair of Connaught of his princely rank with a stroke of the pen. So you can be stripped of your princely rank. You can't, the king can't strip anybody of a peerage. That has to be stripped by parliament. Mm -hmm. And people don't seem to understand that. So we're speaking about two sets of titles, the peerages and the princely rank. A stroke of the pen could strip any prince of his rank, but it has to be parliament that strips of a peerage, so the, so it's a two. It would be a two prong process. Also, I have to say, I was approached by a former private secretary. I suppose two or three years ago now. I did a short video on it, about a minute or three minutes or something, ages ago, trying to get me to do a petition in Parliament that would had that would would have. Uh, allowed Harry to be stripped of his title, and I refused to do it. I said, mm. I said, I'm not doing it because it sets a dangerous precedent. Uh, it's mob rule. Mm. Uh, it's it's the press able to say whatever they want, and 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 uh, it's, so today they don't like Harry. Tomorrow they don't like someone else, and it's 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 a rule. It's 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 a recipe for injustice. So I refuse to do it. Oh, Pat, thank you so much and thanks. good luck good luck you've got thanks. to see a picture of a, of the baby okay oh, there we go. Bye -bye. <laughs> thank you, Kat. and now we're going to head to uh darren donaldson who is one of our first ever outspoken members in scotland darren what's your question for lady c good evening lady c you're looking fabulous as always thank you and Dan, you're handsome as ever. But Thank my you. question is, Lady C, have you received your complimentary jar of scam jam yet? Or are you sticking... <laughs> I'm just sticking to Morrison's jam. What about you? <laughs> scam jam, I love that. Yes. yes. Uh, well, of, course, of course, you know, the whole thing is a diversion, isn't it? You yes. know, it, and it's a way of her keeping herself in the news and distracting from any awkward matters that might be arising at the same time. But, you know, what's really interesting is he, she hasn't actually said she made the jam and she can't have made the jam because I've been, you know, I, I sometimes make jam, never, never strawberry. I don't like strawberries. Um, and a friend of mine was saying to me actually today she said you know i mean you do a whole pot of a whole thing of jam to maybe get five pots and she said it's strawberry jam is the most difficult jam to make because you can only put in a certain amount of pectin and if you put in too much it's too runny or too, it's too hard if you put in too little it's too too runny she's and and she said she'd have had to have made maybe to get 50 things she'd have made 10 lots of jam but evidently there's a place near where she lives that does sell the jam in bulk and it sells it in those pots as well and there's no label on them mm -hmm. and and it is suspected that that's how that jam came about <laughs> Thank you. Oh, great question, Darren. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah P. Sarah P., where are you? Where are you calling from? I'm up in Manchester in the north. <laughs> oh, lovely to have you. What is your question for Lady C? Well, oh, sorry. I'm just having a nice glass of wine to join you on your first video. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously... Excellent. I'll have one after. <laughs> you need to. So, um... Obviously, Charles and his darling boy, I don't think anything will come out, any truth will come out as a result of darling boy. Um, I think that'll be covered up. Do you think this will all remain covered until William takes the throne? 
Mm, good question. Is it for me or you, Dan? <laughs> for you, <laughs> for you actually. Okay. Oh. Well, oh. well, I think uh, it could do, but Lady C, you you think there's more chance, don't you, of of the truth emerging before William takes the throne? I don't think the truth is ever going to emerge unless there is such a hue and cry or something truly untoward and, and I mean, properly untoward, like maybe unlawful that happens. I think otherwise, I think it's, it's going to be brushed under the carpet, brushed under the carpet and ignored, ignored, ignored in the hope that it will go away. And if, and because, I mean, I understand why the palace would want to ignore this, because Meghan has manipulated the situation, as has Harry, to the extent that, that it, on the face of it, no matter what the palace does, there is, people are going to say, well, you, you have some responsibility for this cocker. Well, I mean, the longer it goes on, of course, is the more responsible they do become. Uh, but as I try to point out to people here, that the palace can't act if they are being given ironclad assurances, even if they know that the ironclad assurances are illusory. They can't act on their suspicions. And so I don't think anything's going to happen. Oh, well, I mean, something, you know, something truly unexpected could happen. And that could send all the apples tumbling out of the apple cart. But between now and then, I really think that it's it's going to be lie, doggle, play ostrich and ignore. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for your question. We have thank the lovely Jane Noble Knight with us now. Jane, where are you? I'm in Staffordshire. I'm on the old Josiah Wedgwood estate, so just south of Stoke. Oh, lovely to have you. Mm. And what is your question for Lady C? Well, Lady C, lovely to see you and Dan. I see that you share certain skill sets and I'm fascinated by how you came to be doing this and getting the stories and investigating. Were you always naturally curious? Did you just evolve into what you're doing? Could you ever have imagined? The world has changed a lot, uh, a lot but that this would be what you were doing now. And it's fascinating to me. Can you tell me more, please? Mm, Lady C, how did you get here doing this? Well, I certainly didn't imagine that I would ever end up doing something like this. And I certainly wasn't brought up to do something like this. On the contrary, my parents were absolutely horrified. At the, in fact, most of my family was horrified when I wrote my first animal, you know, because to them, uh, the possibility that my, that my social position and therefore their social position might be affected was something that uh, really perturbed them greatly. But of course, my bacon was saved by the Morton book because I knew that if Diana had done what she did with me and she, she would and failed, she would try to find someone else to do it and would succeed, which indeed is exactly what happened with Andrew Morton. So I I knew that uh, if I, I also knew if I didn't write the book, that what Diana had in store for Charles, and it was untrue and unfair, and that if I didn't write my book uh, and get the truth out first, when she got her version of the truth, which was certainly untrue, out, it would have devastated his reputation. And so I, there was actually a moral obligation once I knew what she planned to get it out. But also I didn't want to give back the money. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Jane, thank you so much.
Ems is with us now. Ems, what's your question for Lady C? Hi, both of you. And hi, Lady C. Thank you so much. I'm a big fan. I've just got your book and I'm wading my way through it. Um, I wanted to talk about Mexit because obviously we know what we've been told about Mexit. But I was wondering if you had any thoughts on whether you believe that actually there was something more to it. Um, because their behaviour since doesn't seem to kind of go in the line of we want to leave, we want a private life, which we know they don't. They kind of they're very angry. So do you think that there was something about Mexit that they actually didn't really want to go? Oh, no, they wanted to go. They oh, did. She wanted, she wanted to go. She all oh, she 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 never, ever wanted to stay. From, she never gave up any of her Hollywood connections. She was setting up all sorts of commercial deals. This is how I came to write the book, because people objected to the, her conduct. So, you know, she absolutely was, she wore, She entered the royal family thinking, mm, this is an opportunity to milk. She's a great one for milking cows. She never gives her milk away for nothing. And she expects every cow to be gushing in her direction and she she set up the whole thing with with uh, antagonizing people for pur purposely refusing to fit in uh, picking fights with Harry's friends and being really awkward and mm. uh, antagonistic with Harry's friends so that she could then complain about them to Harry uh, she set out to get him to California to fulfill her ambition of being a great star and a billionaireess. And what, where it all fell down was after she'd, uh, she'd copyrighted absolutely everything down to the hairpin in the maid's quarters. Uh, you know, <laughs> everything was royal status. Then she found out that she couldn't use that. And she also found out that she couldn't be half in and out. And that's when, because Megan, I am told by people who have known her all her life and know her very well, has always been extremely spiteful and nasty when she is thwarted. If she doesn't get her own way, she will move heaven and earth to mow you down. And that's where all of the malice and the spite and the venom and the viciousness came in. When the queen said, no, you can't be half in, half out. She had it all planned. She, they were gonna go to Canada for a few months. Then they were gonna drift south to, to LA and she was gonna become a huge star. She was gonna <laughs> take, she was gonna be Elizabeth Taylor and Scarlett Johansson and everybody rolled into one and, and, <laughs> and then none of it happened. And her rage, and she is evidently the sort of person who when she's thwarted, she is enraged to a psychopathic degree. And mm -hmm. certainly a pathological degree. Let me rephrase that to a pathological degree. And that's where everything derailed. Had they been allowed to be to be six eight months to ten months of the year in California with her cutting her deals, and originally, of course, she wanted to be the, the great ingenue. She was going to be playing Debbie Reynolds' 22-year-old parts, you know, uh, 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 opposite the, the latest hot stud. And, <laughs> and she was going to fulfill that dream and she was going to get an Oscar and then she was going to go on to be a billionaire and have all sorts of hands in the fire and then ultimately the president of the United States of America because her ambitions are limitless as indeed are her boundaries. She doesn't have boundaries. And it's when all of that was thwarted that she had to come up with a different scenario. Otherwise, everything would have been copacetic. Oh, yes, I love everybody. Everybody loves me and so on. She'd have been playing the, and repeating and re reliving the act that she played with all of the journalists and all of the interviewers 
in her suit stay where she was always enthusiastic. Oh, I'm so grateful for everything and on the hands everywhere. And I'm just so grateful, you know, and I'm blessed and everybody's just so wonderful to me and everybody loves me and I have the best father in the world. And, and, and of course it all fell down because the queen said, no half in half out. And mm -hmm. that's what happened. And they, it was never about a private life. It was about her fulfilling her inordinate ambitions, partly for professional, partly attention, and and partly financial. And it, she 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 married Harry, thinking, "Oh my goodness, gosh, I've I've got now that's an udder that I can milk." Oh, yes. Thank oh, you. Thank yes. you. Yeah, that's what I Great thought. question, Ems. Thank you so much. And Thank last you. member's question of the day to Mary. Mary, where are you? I am in southern Utah. Love southern it. Utah. Thanks. Yeah, if you've ever been here, come anytime. We'll show you around. Oh, my um, goodness. I want to take you up on that. Seriously, I'm very serious. Yeah, we love, we love having people come here. It's beautiful here. Natural beauty. We have a ton of natural beauty. So I have to ask you, Lady yes. C, first of all, thank you, Lady C, for improving my vocabulary rather dramatically. <laughs> I am loving your book because I'm learning so much. Um, and I am an Anglophile. I've been there numerous times. Actually, last year, I spent the whole month of May in London. And it was wow. Amazing. I did. Yeah, just by myself. It was awesome. Anyway, at what point, and, and I have grown children. And so my heart aches for the king and his wife. Mm -hmm. It's like, at what point does the king say, enough mm. i am done with you you know but as a parent i wouldn't get to that point but i would certainly just say you know when your behavior looks like this then we can talk well my understanding is that the king is a lot more firm than he than he's being given credit for being number one but number two he is very spiritual he believes firmly in god he believes uh, in this, you know, he's a father. He loves his son. And I think there is also an element with him of the possibility that Harry was born somewhat defective because Diana mm. had serious bulimia when she was mm. pregnant with Harry. And uh, I think any parent of a child that could have been born slightly off, let's put it that way, would always think, well, it, to an extent, it's not entirely his fault, which it isn't. So I think, and also Charles is doubtless aware of, you know, the fact that Diana, used to set those children up against him. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to an extent, and I don't want to badmouth Dan because she had many virtues, but she she also could be a very naughty girl. And mm -hmm. to an extent, you know, some of Megan's behavior is reminiscent of Diana's, except Diana was a novice while Megan is an accomplished uh, manipulator. She has summa cum laude in, <laughs> in, in all of these antics. But I think with all of that going on, you know, I, I get why it's difficult, if not impossible, for a father in a situation like that. To, I mean, he's, he's certainly set boundaries that he has. And, you know, they are, a, a part of the technique has been to allow Harry and Meghan to hang themselves with the rope that they've been given. And mm. they're doing a very good job of it. And they have exposed themselves. And also the king does, he doesn't only occupy the position of father, <laughs> He occupies the position of monarch and he occupies the position of supreme governor of the Church of England. So he has three hats that he has to wear. The supreme governor hat needs to be compassionate, responsible, uh, loving. 
but firm. Uh, the king hat needs to be, well, how far can I allow this to go? And as long as Harry actually doesn't do anything totally illegal, this can go on forever. Mm. That's my feeling about it. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I do think so. But I think there were a couple of red lines. And one of the red lines was, of course, about Harry's criticism of Camilla. And Charles attempted to warn Harry, don't go there. He didn't mind even if he was attacked in spare, but he really didn't want Harry attacking his wife because he felt like she had had a raw deal over many years. And what did Harry do? He went for the wives, not just Camilla. He went for Catherine too. And certainly from William's point of view, that was unforgivable. I think Charles is a bit more forgiving than William. But as Lady C says, he's been tough. You know, he booted him out of Frogmore Cottage. Good. Uh, he only spent 15 minutes with him, I think it was, Lady C, wasn't it? 12 well minutes. Twelve minutes after he after the cancer diagnosis, and it felt like Camilla couldn't have got Charles away quicker. So yeah, that's where I'm at. But thank you so much, Mary. I'll, I'll hit you up. I'll hit you up when I'm Please in Utah. Do. <laughs> um, and ladies, see, look, just have one final uh, breaking uh, question coming in, which I do think is important to be asked, because you will have seen Samantha Cohen, who was previously the top advisor for the Queen, the late Queen, but then worked for Harry and Meghan. She sort of did it as a favour to the Queen. The late Queen has spoken out this week and revealed that she was part of this bullying inquiry into Meghan. So Sarah asked asks, do you think the bullying report will ever see the light of day? What do you think would be a trigger for Kensington Palace to release the report? And how far would the Harkles need to go before it's made public? Well, I really don't see how Kensington Palace can reveal the report, because it would be violating all sorts of corporate protocols. Mm. I mean, you know, you you do a, a report, it's done on the basis of confidentiality. And, you know, unless they got everybody's agreement, but, but even then it would set a dangerous precedent because the next time there needs to be an inquiry, people would shy away from being a part of it if mm. they felt their contribution became public. And, you know, there's also the question that if, if it's publicized and the identities of the people are revealed, uh, you know, they can be attacked. Some of Meghan and Harry's followers are deranged. You know, okay, I I have absolute disdain for them. And to an extent, I'm very lucky to be able to have absolute disdain for them because, you know, there's little or nothing they can do to me that's going to affect me per se. But I mean, People who are leading more exposed lives than I am, uh, they their their safety or their professions or their well-being could be endangered. I mean, I'm to an extent very fortunate because I function at a completely different level. But you know, they would they would be open to danger. So I really don't see the palace being able. I mean, any company in that situation cannot reveal the they can re, they can reveal the findings of the report, but they can't reveal the minutia of the report, and they can't reveal the details. But the details have already actually got out, you know. And I think uh, this Samantha Cohen's thing is our uh, is is a distraction as well it's a, it's it's to divert people so and uh you know i think your good friend tom bauer did something about it you know and uh, yes i saw it on said, my... yes he says it's going it's it's going to go from a trickle to a stream or some such thing hardly a deluge though 
I know, which is a shame. I would love to be leaked that report. If anyone at Kensington Palace wants to leak me that report, I will gratefully receive it. Uh, I want to see it. I desperately want to see it. Uh, Lady Colin Campbell, you are unparalleled in your brilliance when it comes to the royal family. Harry and Meghan, the real story, persecutors or victim. You must read this book. It is the inside story of Harry and Meghan. It contains the information that the mainstream media are too scared, or as Lady C said, too cowardly to reveal. And I think as the years go on, this will become a seminal piece of work in terms of what was going on during a very fascinating part of royal history. So congratulations on another amazing book and thank you so much for being here tonight lady c for our outspoken town hall you'll have to come back soon please <laughs> thank you dan it's been a pleasure thank you lady c god bless <laughs>